Cool. Well, thank you very much for, for that, uh, Jasmine. And um, so, um, yeah, so a little, a little bit of background. Um, so um, my name is Jess Groom, uh, founder and CEO of Cowrie Consulting. Um, uh, my previous background was in advertising, marketing, media, um, and doing more work in, I suppose, persuasion and influence in some big agencies like Bartle Bowie Hegarty, Ogilvy, some small agencies. I had my own, my own small agency and we sold that to a big agency. Um, but I really, really caught the bug uh, for behavioural change, I think um, it was called. Um, in like the mid noughties um, and um, and then it exploded in 2008 with behavioral economics uh, being born um, and the advent of nudge theory um, and then that broadened out to behavioral science and um, I think one thing that, that I found was um, I, I read the books read the journals um, there wasn't any academic courses you could take at that time I really wanted to go back to university um, they didn't really exist then I think Warwick had just started um, and um, I said to my wife, I'd really like to go back and go back to university. Um, and she had other other uh, intentions. Uh, we had three small boys, a big mortgage. And um, so politely said, actually, a highly paid job in advertising would be quite good right now. Um, so I went to Ogilvy, uh, worked with Rory, we co-founded um, Ogilvy Change, which then became Ogilvy Consulting after I left and prototyped like a behavioral science consultancy. Um, I was really conscious that um, the NUD unit was obviously formed in 2011 um, with David and Owen, and um, that was brilliant. You know, it is it is brilliant. You know, uh, in the public sector, um, but I really felt that um, culturally, um, the desire from the private sector, you know, and businesses um, was was different. And um, so, and we had experience of doing that, obviously, um, in some form or, or other. So um, I formed Cowrie in um, 2016, and so had the business plan. In 2015, um, got some investment, angel investors, and three of us um, it were starting the business, myself, Zebra, and Rafi, um, on day zero. Um, and then Will, who's now CEO, um, was like one of my, my, been my business partner for 30 years. Um, we set the business up. So classic startup to scale up. So we started with three people. Um, we've got a 38 uh, person headcount now. Um, and um, I think with a well, I think we, we know we're the biggest business focused uh, behavioral science consultants in the UK. And I'll come back to that because scale um, allows you to do things um, which are quite interesting. So it's less about kind of chess beating. It's more about actually what does what does that mean? So one of the I suppose the, the, the key things is um, we focus a lot on customer and colleague experience. Um, and um, so we, we did a lot of work in customer experience. We used to have positioning, which was the science behind customer experience, but we started to find that we were doing a lot more work in employee and colleague experience. So to, to wrap those two together, um, we, we um, are now, I suppose, driving behind this science behind exceptional experiences. I'll talk a little bit about the business um, and then show some case studies and then, then we're going to have a QA. and a um, so, so essentially, yeah, with a, with a wave and tsunami of, of AI, machine learning and predictive analytics, you know, what we're finding is businesses are building platforms and experiences without having that human touch. And it really requires behavioral science to really capture uh, and realize the potential of this kind of new innovative future. Um, as I said before, like the team, um, we're um, tiny, I guess, compared to some of the businesses that we work with. But in terms of um, uh, scale, we're one of the biggest sort of business focused or if not the biggest business focused um, behavioral science consultants in the UK now. Um, so second to like BIT, but they do a lot of public sector work. And um, I'll talk about the disciplines um, in, in the process, but we have four key disciplines, uh, a behavioral researcher, um, a behavioral architect, a uh, behavioral designer and an experimental designer. Um, and most people can generally do all four, but they excel in one particular area. So it's not a case of pass the parcel or silo. Essentially, we've just got integrated teams that have got um, specialisms. Um, I think behavioral design is the critical bit um, that I think will be most of interest to you guys. In terms of the clients that we work with, um, so we work with some of the biggest brands and businesses in the world. Um, and um, so somehow we managed to work with number Fortune one and two, so Amazon and Walmart, and um, but we also have built with some big financial services and, and retailers um, and media companies um, globally and also in, in the UK. And then um, we work internationally. Um, so I should chat with Jasmine. Um, so we're we're part of the Diversify Network. So there's 18 consultancies that works with all these clients globally um, to make sure we've got cross-cultural understanding of UX, UI, but behavioral design and, and broader behavioral behavioral science. And we've done a lot of work. Um, we're training a lot of people, we're helping clients build centers of excellence um, and we're also accredited. So you, you can see there in the bottom left, we're certified by uh, GABS, which is the Global Association of Applied Behavioral Science, relatively new, um, but it's a professional accreditation for our, for our discipline. 
so that's a bit about the business. I don't want to sell the business. You want to give you a bit of a background, reassure you that, you know, I think we're, we're doing some good work. But these, this is where it gets interesting, is these are the services we offer. And um, so we offer um, insight services um, where we, we feel called DIG. Uh, we have consultative services, which we call FIX. Uh, we have capability building services, which we call TEACH. And we have innovation services, which we call BUILD. And there's a real sense of irony, I think, that behavioural science uh, professes to essentially make things cognitively easy. Um, but, but more often than not, it makes it really difficult to understand and engage with the businesses. Um, they come across as overly academic and technical. Um, and we try to smash through that with kind of more, more fluent design. So those are the kind of the four services, and I'll bring to life some of those kind of throughout throughout the presentation. So one of the things I think that, that uh, Jasmine particularly was interested in was just outlining kind of like some of our processes. And, um, and this is our consultative process. And one of the things we say that behavioral science often is, is human science, not rocket science, uh, but we do follow scientific method. Um, so more often than not, when we're tasked with a project, what we will do is uh, conduct some form of diagnostic in um, the form of an audit, um, utilising different methods. Uh, just, just wait a second, my dog is just whining a bit. Shush. There you go, that's a bit better. Um, the second one is uh, behavioural design. And um, what we do is we don't have you strict UX, UI people. Uh, what we have is um, essentially psychologists that are trained in conceptual design. So they design kind of prototypes of websites and apps and things like this. Um, but what we don't do is code. Um, so we are nowhere near as good as, I guess, a lot of you on the call. Uh, and we've done that deliberately um, because, you know, one of the things that I learned, um, I suppose, quite early on in business is, you know, to, to achieve success, Excel be exceptional. You need to focus on, on something. And we focus on behavioral design, um, but not um, essentially build, building the final um, execution. Um, and then uh, what we do do, I think, particularly well is um, we test things really, really rigorously. So I'm not a great fan of kind of think aloud techniques in U UX UI. I think that reveals kind of a claim preference rather than maybe a revealed preference. Um, and um, it's helpful, but I think it's only half the answer. And then what we do do is like rigorous testing um, with statistical and, and empirical significance, like in the real world, as well as laboratory. So, so, you know, hopefully what you'll get from the case studies is a flavor of like creative design using sort of behavioral science and then I suppose brought to life in live experiments. So, so to bring it to life, I'm just going to talk about this one, um, which I was flabbergasted by, to be honest, I didn't know it actually existed. Um, but um, uh, there are some behavioral science principles that you see like on Facebook and BuzzFeed about, you know, wine lists and, you know, a great behavioral science principle is, you know, um, in wine lists that people essentially often choose the second or third bottle on a wine list because they're so embarrassed that they don't want to choose the first one because it's so expensive, but they don't appear cheap to buy the lower one. So they, they tend to go for two or three in the list. Um, and, and that tends to be the ones that the restaurant will put the most profitable, highest margin price bottles in so they make more money. And um, so that, that that's circulating, you know, that is on the internet freely available. But um, we uh, essentially have gone deep into the academic journals to try and understand uh, how forensically we can design things utilizing kind of neurodesign principles, which I'm sure you'd be familiar with, with some, or, or maybe not all of these. But to bring it to life, I'll just talk about, about this. So this is a menu. So this is like an analog menu, but we also do digital menus. And um, uh, so this is kind of the interface, if you like. So standard menu. Um, and it looks really, really complicated. So, you know, the first thing is that, that people feel quite overwhelmed. When people feel overwhelmed with too much choice, they procrastinate. And often when they do make a decision, they actually don't feel like they made a, a, an optimal decision. So, so, so just automatically, you can see that, that too much information creates creates a problem. One of my favorite insights, which Rafi is our chief design officer, was that um, illustrations and, and images, our brains are really, really highly programmed to, to look at these first and process them quickly and um, rather than words. So our brains are really attracted to essentially the illustrations of the plants and the vegetation and the herbs on the side. Um, and that grabs our attention. And that was kind of like hypothetically, that's what we think, that's what we know. Uh, and uh, but we, we would need to test that. And um, so it's quite ironic that if you wanted to design a menu where you didn't want people to read it, the best thing you could do would be to put pictures on every corner so it detracts the eye from the main, the main event. Um, anyway, so uh, we told the client that and then also like 32 other things that are psychologically wrong with this menu um, around pricing and the ordering and the language, etc. Um, what we then do is um, evidence that. 
Um, so this is a pop-out algorithm um, that on a database rather than live real people, where essentially you can see here that that hypothesis is borne out to be true, that illustrations um, are, are really particularly helpful sometimes or, or potentially in this case distracting. And um, so and we do a series of these to kind of elicit and, and uh, I suppose support kind of our, our evidence. And then we redesign it. So this is the redesign menu. So I take and no personal, uh, I suppose, um, thanks for this, but this is all Rafi uh, March, who's our chief design officer and her team. And automatically you can see that essentially you've got more white space or kind of creamy space, but it's just pl more pleasurable on the eye. And um, so it just feels nicer. Also as well, we've got more uh, de space dedicated to starters and desserts. In the previous one, uh, people get a lot of main dishes, they can see the main dishes. Um, so they tend to buy main dishes, so it sets a default and normalises that people don't buy starters and desserts because the, the menu doesn't dedicate much space to them. Whereas here, we've got kind of parity equal between starters, uh, menus and desserts, uh, mains and desserts. And then uh, you see the illustrations punctuate, so they essentially draw the eye into the different sections rather than take them away. And then my favourite insight of all is that um, you can see here that the glasses uh, in the top left for the cocktails, you can see which glassware uh, that the drink comes in. Uh, and we had we, we picked up an insight um, for which we picked up I think it was working with Diageo was that that men find it very very difficult to buy uh, cocktails because they don't know what glass it's going to come in so that they don't buy cocktails because they don't want to be embarrassed in the bar but if you show them the glass then they feel quite comfortable with it so that's kind of like the I suppose the design um, obviously went through a few number of iterations with client um, and with the, the brand team and with the, the, op, the ops team to make sure all of it worked we then took it into the laboratory um, to do some biometric work so this is live person eye tracking this is the back of the menu the new menu um, and then you can see here um, it flips over um, and then you can see that people um, start on the left hand side so they can see the dots are on the left hand side broadly then the middle so it's in the middle and it goes to the right hand side so it follows like a spiral pattern which is the ideal kind of um, processing sort of map if you like for for the menu and then they do it again so so what we've got here is that people are engaging with it but essentially going starter main and dessert um, we can then take all of that data and start to look at images to see what does that actually mean, look at like fixation patterns and intensity, which again, I'm sure you've done a lot of this, and you can broadly see on the left that people just get stuck in the middle, so it's not a good thing that people essentially dwell there, um, so it senses they just can't choose, whereas you can see on the right hand side, people spend kind of like equal amounts of time broadly across the different different menus. And then here's the critical thing, I think, which is different from, from maybe some of the, the UX UI work, is we do live experimental trial. So we had like um, a mirrored restaurant, so control restaurants and live restaurants with the only difference being essentially the menus. Um, and the target was 4p increased spend per head, and we actually got to 13 pence um, and an increase of, of 8 pence uh, per gross profit per head. So the real statistically significant across the, the two mirrored and, and control and treatment uh, restaurant groups. Um, and then this was kind of, kind of rolled out. And I think that's for me is like the, the fascinating bit when you do square the circle between a diagnostic, a redesign in laboratory and then a live trial in context and, and see what happens to the behavior. Um, ethically, we're happy with this because the frequency that people went to this restaurant wasn't exhaustive. So, you know, if they're going there every day and they didn't have the money to spend in the restaurant, then we wouldn't actually work on a brief that promoted um, increased sales. And um, but it, the, the frequency of this was special occasion broadly. It's like meeting friends or, or maybe maybe some form of, of event. So that's kind of like forensic like detail. So there was th sorry, there's about 30 other principles that were used in terms of um, the fonts. Like th there is an academic paper about how many fonts you can use in a menu to, to generate um, the best type of satisfaction. So it all, it all exists in the journals. And, and yeah, there's another 29 after that. Um, one of the things that when you work in the private sector around UX, UI kind of behavioral design is that um, you sometimes, not, not always, and we're hypersensitive, I feel, people often um, think that all you do all day is essentially get people to buy things that they don't really need or more of it like a bit like the brief before and obviously we have our, our checks and balances but what we know um, and what a lot of people don't know is actually there's a lot of behavioral science around customer experience and colleague experience that uses behavioral science that actually has got nothing to do with you know selling or retaining um, customers it might be about a good experience for both parties but it's not directly linked to, to sale um, and this is one of these these projects that essentially um, you may be familiar with this term it's very very popular in the UK but um, in financial services um, there's um, a significant 
it's around about five percent of um, a particular kind of audience um, uh, sort of in the country or, or, or I guess globally if it, it mirrors that um, that are vulnerable so that might be people that have got like mental difficulties or physical um, difficulties so it might be they're blind or it might be they can't hear or uh, it might be they um, cognitively impaired and can't process things but it, but it could be also emotions so one of the kind of the the, the misobservations is that the essentially vulnerability is only exhibited by five percent of people um, and it's just not true so um, we are all vulnerable at some time in our lives so you know you might have a, a recent bereavement or you might have a significant interaction at work where you're made redundant or you might have um, something where you, you within your relationships that you break up or, or divorce so we are all vulnerable at certain times in our lives and often this comes at times when we're making big decisions like when you get divorced you know that might mean actually some big financial changes or certainly a bereavement um, and, and we need to be cognizant of that so so we essentially built a vulnerability training um, program for financial services organizations but what we did is made like a big shift out of those really kind of dry compliance training where it's more information based to get people to really experience what it was like to be vulnerable so it's not a huge shift um it's not like i said it's not rocket science it's human science but you know if you can get people to experience what it's like to be vulnerable then essentially you can walk in their shoes so we designed and there's a, there's a quick film i'll just show the first minute of it um there's a little bit of an intro from rifat who's the head of vulnerability that's driving this agenda at this company which is a big pension company um, in, in the UK um, called Standard Life and who are part of Phoenix and um, she does a little bit of an intro about why we're doing it and then I'll just show you the first one which is kind of more of a um, an experiencing like maybe a physical uh, vulnerability but I'll, I'll let the film tell the story. At Phoenix Group, we are the trusted home for millions of customers' life savings, and it's a responsibility we take very seriously. So it's vitally important for us that all of our colleagues understand the role that they have to play in supporting customers in vulnerable circumstances, and how our inaction and also action um, is linked to vulnerability. That's why we chose to partner with Cowdery Consulting to deliver a brand new engaging e-learning that's going to deliver in a very creative way some really important messages about why it's important that we support customers in vulnerable circumstances and more importantly how our colleagues can also support their well-being because we know that this is not an easy ask of them. We want our e-learning to not just be another module colleagues have to take. Using behavioural science, we're creating an immersive experience to give them a first-person perspective of what it's like to be vulnerable. Following the FCA guidelines, we're highlighting the four main areas of vulnerability, which include financial capability, health issues, financial resilience, and live events. We know from research in behavioural science that experiencing something firsthand is a great way to close the empathy gap and to put ourselves in the shoes of others. By bringing to life what it's like to be vulnerable in these four areas, will make it easier for them to realize the importance of treating vulnerable customers with compassion. One way we can do this is by showing people what it's like to live with a severe visual impairment. We've recreated this experience in the form of a 3D video with a street view, which lets people feel what it's like to carry out regular daily activities with this condition. This 3D street view gives a first person perspective of walking outside the Phoenix office with a severe macular degeneration. This will allow us to tailor our responses to meet the customer's needs. It's clear that when someone's facing a serious health issue, their decision-making can be impacted. This ability to make rational decisions can be even harder when it comes to abstract subjects like finance. So what we found was that um, it was kind of shared on the platform, the learning platform, but the completion rates were really high. There's a little bit of a buzz about it, bizarrely, um, that people were kind of really not enjoying it, that'd be the wrong word, but I think it was just a a different type of, of digital interaction um, that felt quite immersive and um, what was really really encouraging although this isn't statistically significant but it's the first time that they experienced it <coughs> was that um, the vulnerable customer score like the customer satisfaction score outscored like non-vulnerable customers um, which is pretty pretty remarkable you know often when customers are, are being dealt with by colleagues you know they find it easier to deal with essentially people that, that are lacking um, in, in these vulnerabilities and may potentially more more easy to do business with but I think what was really interesting is people really got behind this um, and then started to understand and really kind of show compassion uh, for, for these types types of issues such that customers were reflecting that in, in CSAT 
And um, so, like I said, it's not statistically significant, but it did flip um, the other way for the first time. So the final case study, um, and then you were really happy to wrap up for, for questions, essentially is, um, I suppose, hyper I suppose hyper personalization and micro segmentation. So a big theme and topic within kind of digital experience right now. Um, and this is what some work we did for a pension company. And, and I know you guys, uh, you know how much is in your pension. Like if I asked you all, you'd say, yeah, I know how much is in it. I know what funds I'm invested in. I know where all my pensions are. Um, I have them on my digital screen or I have an app that does all of that. Um, but more often than not, people don't. And um, because people don't engage with pensions because they're in the future, they're boring, they're complex um, and something to worry about when you're maybe my age at like 53. And um, but actually you need to engage with them quite early because if you do engage with them earlier, then actually can lead to some really, really good outcomes. So so what we decided to do is rather than kind of like overwhelm people with like statements with loads of words and numbers and just really, really complex stuff is essentially just tell a story through pictures. Um, and we work with Aegon, a pension company, and also a creative company who designed this, um, a data company that essentially did all of the housing and, and brought it to life, and then a platform a company which does hyper-personalized uh, videos. Uh, and what happens is that essentially you would be on a platform in, in your your account, you press a button and basically it dynamically renders a, a four minute video for you in real time. And um, so as your name, etc. And I'll show you that. But it also looks at what funds you're invested in, how, what the price of those are. Obviously, they've gone down recently in the UK with the recent economic turmoil, but it does all of that in real time. So this isn't a preloaded video that, you know, you get sent out. Essentially, it's created for you in a matter of seconds. And what we did is <clears throat> we implemented like 36 different behavioral science principles into the film and uh, the first one was highlight sense of ownership so often people refer to their pensions as their company pension when actually it's your pension but i just want to pick on some like really oblique and lateral kind of behavioral science principles that we put through the behavioral design sort of lens and then we made sure we're baked into essentially the final film so the first one is that people feel anxious about future finances they never know whether they've got enough money and how much they're going to need so we wanted to reassure them so at the beginning of the film you'll hear birdsong um, and we know the bird song from an evolutionary biological, uh, evolutionary psychological perspective creates this biological response of a kind of feeling of safety. And that's because when birds are around, it means that predators aren't. You know, if, the, if there's a saber tooth tiger or a Tyrannosaurus rex in caveman and cave women times, then essentially the birds would fly away and you'd be aware that there was something quite wrong if it was particularly quiet. Um, and we can utilize that kind of insight from prehistoric times, cave men, cave women times, and bring that back to a digital experience in pensions. The second one is I'm sure you play uh, essentially first person games um, certainly um, my boys do play Battlefront at the moment quite a lot, um, but essentially, you know, this creates this very, very immersive um, experience and it feels almost like real life. And um, so in terms of the way that the video was shot, um, we made sure that the creative team was brief to say, actually, um, you've got to look through the eyes of the user rather than seeing a person that maybe uh, represents you or, or maybe not as an, an avatar. And then the final one was um, within the film, towards the end of the film, it starts to essentially model the behavior. So within the video, we start to say, this is where you need to click. This is what you need to do if you would like to do these things so people can, can mirror it. So very, very simply modeling behavior. You know, if you've ever coached anybody, you know, the first thing say would be talk about the drill, um, model the drill, um, and then essentially get people to, to be involved in the drill. Um, and essentially, this is this is what we did. So I'll show you the video to bring it to life a little bit. Um, again, just for the first minute, I won't show all the four minutes, um, and then I'll talk about the outcomes. Hello, Robbie. Welcome to your Aegon personalized pension summary. We've made this video especially for you, where we'll cover details about your pension, such as your contributions, your fund, and what your pension pot might be when you come to retire. We've put all of this information and more into your yearly statement, which will be with you on your policy anniversary. At your current age, we can see that now is an important time to continue building your pension. For now, make yourself comfortable and let's take a look at what's been happening with your pension over the last 12 months. So, here's what you've invested and here's what your employer has invested in that time. And, as you know, you contribute through salary sacrifice, so you've helped to boost your pension pot. Which means the value of your pension pot is currently at this amount. It seems like your employer contributing to your pension is a valuable benefit Additionally, you also have the payments you've made into your ISA. 
So what was interesting was um, the people that look at their pensions, it's, it's around about 5%. So uh, 19 out of 20 people on average don't look at a paper statement. Um, but what we were finding was that 41% of people were, were opening up uh, the emails that essentially were sent through to promote it. Um, and of those, 85% watched a four minute video. We thought actually, uh, we did a lot of user testing beforehand, but in live trials, and we found that people actually watched it again and again. Not, not many, um, I mean, it was, it was a smaller proportion of the 85%, but critically of the 85%, 22% were checking their goal planner. So that would be things like how much money you might need in retirement, like how big does your pension pot need to be to have a, an annual income of 20,000 pounds or dollars or euros. 8% um, switch funds. So, um, so essentially that might be switching into a, a more riskier fund that might have a better return in the long term. 12% uh, of people started to bring uh, their pension pots together so they could see them all in one place. Um, and what we found in the pile alone, um, there was 1.3 million pounds worth of assets flowed onto the platform. Um, and there was a one in 250,000 chance it was it was due to chance. So again, coming back to the scientific method. And um, so this essentially project, the pilot washed its face. So essentially kind of paid over for all the costs. And then this has kind of been rolled out Initially, it was like 100,000 customers, and it was 600,000, then 3 million, and it's been launched in, in America, sort of off the back of that. So kind of in summary, really, um, hopefully um, you've had a brief intro to Cowry. So, you know, we're a kind of a behavioral design led behavioral science company, which I think is pretty, pretty unique. Um, we have 10 behavioral designers uh, that are psychologists, uh, behavioral scientists that are trained in, in design uh, to a conceptual level. Some of them can code, uh, not as good as maybe some, some of you on the call, but, but certainly we can stop at that, that point. Um, hopefully you've seen from the case studies, like behavioral science is a real thing. It has business benefit, um, a lot to do with the design and the, and, and the interfaces and the experience and um, yeah i'm really happy to take um, any questions that may have come up or, or that you have about business or, or behavioral science in general so i will come out of of this um, and um, happy to answer questions <laughs>